In the early 1950s, the Cold War was rapidly intensifying. The Soviet Union had successfully tested their first atomic bomb in Kazakhstan in 1949, and now both countries were rapidly growing their nuclear arsenals and developing more powerful devices. For many people, it seemed as though war was almost inevitable. The fear was that the Soviets could use their new fleet of long-range strategic bombers to fly over the Arctic Circle and launch a nuclear strike on North America. To face this threat, a new kind of aircraft was needed, a supersonic interceptor that could be deployed at a moment's notice from bases in the Canadian Arctic, Alaska, and Greenland, and destroy any incoming bombers before they reach their targets. One of the companies to start work on an aircraft like this was Avro Canada, a subsidiary of the Hawker Siddeley Group based outside of Toronto. Though the company was less than 10 years old, Avro had already found success with their first project, the CF-100 Canuck, an all-weather fighter interceptor, and had flown a prototype of one of the world's first passenger jets, the C-102 Jetliner, only two weeks after the first flight of the de Havilland Comet. By 1953, however, the jetliner had been cancelled. Avro had switched to a new project, something much faster. The Royal Canadian Air Force's requirements for the new interceptor were daunting. It had to be able to maintain a speed of Mach 1.5 at an altitude of 50,000 feet. It had to have a high-speed intercept range of 200 nautical miles. And it had to be able to go from standing still to its top speed and altitude in under five minutes. To get an idea of just how ambitious those goals were, it helps to consider the state of aviation at the time. In the spring of 1952, when the requirements were first presented, there were only three aircraft which had ever broken the sound barrier in level flight. All of them were experimental prototypes powered by rockets. The first jet-powered aircraft to break the sound barrier, the North American F-100 Super Sabre, was still a year away from its first flight. Supersonic flight was incredibly dangerous, too. More than half of the first dozen supersonic pilots were killed in crashes. Avro clearly had their work cut out for them. The design team submitted their initial concept the following July, and after getting approved by the government, started refining the design. The new interceptor would be called the CF-105, or the Arrow. The Arrow was cutting edge in almost every way. Its tailless delta wing design would give it more lift at supersonic speeds, as well as provide more room for internal fuel tanks in order to increase its range. Unlike most military aircraft, which mounted their weapon systems externally under the wings or the belly, the Aero would store its payload in an internal weapons bay to cut down on drag. The Aero was also the first non-experimental aircraft to implement a fly-by-wire system. Traditionally, an airplane pilot's controls were directly connected to the hydraulic systems that move the aircraft's control surfaces. With a fly-by-wire system, the pilot's actions are converted into electronic signals, which are then transferred to the control surfaces. This would cut down on weight and would also allow for more precise control and stability. The Aero would be powered by two turbojet engines developed by Avro's engine division Arenda. Like the rest of the plane, the PS-13 Iroquois engine was cutting edge, able to generate more than 25,000 pounds of thrust with its afterburners. The Aero would be equipped with up to eight radar-guided AIM-4 Falcon missiles developed by Hughes Aircraft. It could also carry up to two Air-2 Genie rockets. These rockets didn't have a guidance system, but they didn't need one. Instead of conventional explosives, each rocket carried a 2 kiloton nuclear warhead that could destroy any aircraft within 300 meters. After the design was finalized in 1955, the Canadian government placed a $260 million order for five Aero Mark I test aircraft, followed by 35 combat-ready Aero Mark II aircraft. Negotiations also began with the United Kingdom to sell up to 150 Aeros to the Royal Air Force. Testing of the design was done with small-scale models in wind tunnels, as well as the construction of a full-scale wooden mock-up. Testing the aerodynamics at supersonic speeds was trickier, since there were no wind tunnels fast enough. Instead, one 8 scale models were strapped to solid rocket boosters, and launched into the skies over Lake Ontario at speeds of up to Mach 1.7. The models transmitted data back to the ground station before crashing into the lake. Development of the aero ran into a series of complications. First was the engine. The Iroquois engines wouldn't be ready in time, so Avro decided to use heavier, less powerful Rolls-Royce RB-106 engines in the five Mark I test aircraft before switching to the Iroquois when the Mark II entered service. Rolls-Royce cancelled development of the engines in 1955, so Avro was forced to switch to using a similar engine from their backup supplier, Curtis Wright. Then, Curtis Wright cancelled development of their engines less than a year later, so Avro had to scramble to find an alternative 
ultimately settling on an engine from Pratt & Whitney. As soon as the problem with the engine was solved, another crisis arose. The Royal Canadian Air Force wasn't happy with the performance of the Falcon missile system, which was almost ready to enter production, and wanted to switch to the Sparrow 2 system, which was still in the early stages of being developed by Douglas Aircraft. Shortly after Avro made the necessary changes to the design of the Arrow to accommodate the new system, they got more bad news. Development of the Sparrow 2 was being abandoned in favor of the Sparrow 3, which wasn't compatible with the Arrow systems. In desperation, an agreement was made. The Canadair Corporation in Quebec would finish developing the Sparrow 2 and would produce it for the Arrow exclusively. This would mean more delays and increased costs. Finally, on October 4th, 1957, the Arrow Mark I was unveiled to the world. Ground and taxi tests were carried out over the winter, and on March 25th, 1958, after more than five years of development, the Avro Arrow took flight for the first time. It performed extremely well, with the test pilots commenting on how well it controlled thanks to the fly-by-wire system. And the Arrow was fast, too. Even with the less powerful Pratt & Whitney engines, the Mark I blew past the Air Force's required performance of Mach 1.5, and on September 14, 1958, the Arrow reached a top recorded speed of Mach 1.98. The first Mark II Arrows were already being assembled in Avro's factory in Malton, Ontario, and would be ready to fly in a few months. With the Iroquois engines installed, they were expected to easily exceed Mach 2, and would have no trouble breaking existing speed and altitude records. And then, on February 20th, 1959, it all came to an abrupt end. The Canadian government made the shocking announcement that the Aero project had been cancelled. Testing would stop immediately, the existing aircraft would be scrapped, the planes would be shredded, and the 15,000 employees involved with the project would be laid off. Several reasons were given for the cancellation. Perhaps the biggest happened on the same day as the Aero's unveiling, when the Soviet Union launched the first artificial satellite into orbit around the Earth. The government knew what that meant. If a nuclear attack happened, the bombs wouldn't be carried by aircraft but by ballistic missiles flying high above the Earth's atmosphere, far out of the reach of interceptor aircraft. Within months after Sputnik launched, the UK had ended all domestic aircraft development and cancelled its order with Avro. The delays in design changes also meant that the Arrow wasn't as cutting edge as its designers had hoped. The Convair Delta Dart and the McDonnell Douglas F-4 Phantom were both on track to enter service at around the same time as the Arrow. And while the Arrow would likely be faster and carry more missiles than most of its contemporaries, its cost had ballooned to almost $10 million per unit, more than twice as much as its competitors. In short, the government reported, the Arrow was overpriced and obsolete before it even entered service. The cancellation of the Arrow has been debated ever since the project came to an end. While it might not have been ideal to fill the role that it was originally designed for, engineers at Avro were already considering adapting the Arrow to fill different roles, including bombing, air superiority, and surveillance. Ideas for improving performance were in the works as well, including plans to increase the speed, range, and altitude. It's entirely possible that given the chance, the Arrow could have excelled in these other roles, like the Delta Dart, which remained in service for more than 30 years. But perhaps the greatest loss was not the airplane itself, but the people who designed it. Within three years of the Arrow's cancellation, Avro Canada had completely shut down, putting almost 50,000 people out of work. Many of the engineers from the Arrow project ended up moving to the United Kingdom and United States, where they began working with Lockheed, NASA, Boeing, and British Aerospace, among others. Former Avro engineers worked on everything from the Concorde to the Apollo program and the Space Shuttle. It'll remain one of the great what-ifs of the Cold War, of what they could have accomplished at Avro, continuing to innovate in new projects after the Arrow. I've put links to the sources used in this video in the description. If you have ideas for future videos, leave a comment. And if you'd like to see more videos like this, click here to subscribe. Thank you.